Thank you, Callum. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> and good evening, everybody. My name is Rosa Murray, and I'm a member of the core group of the Scottish Laity Network. And it's my privilege tonight to welcome you to the fourth evening of our Towards Pentecost 2022 series, listening and responding to the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth. Tonight, our topic is a well-being recovery from COVID with our companion for this evening, Philippa Whitford. Welcome, Philippa. However, as we gather this evening, our thoughts and prayers are still very much with the people of Ukraine. And so we begin our evening in prayer for them. Let us pray for the people of Ukraine. And as we pray for the people of Ukraine, we also remember and pray for the people of Syria, Yemen, Palestine and Iraq, and for all who are suffering due to war and violence. Lord, So in the context of the war in Ukraine and all the wars and acts of violence and aggression that are not reported in our mainstream media, we again recall the words that Pope Paul VI powerfully proclaimed 50 years ago. If you want peace, work for justice. Sadly, 50 years on, our world is in even more in need of justice. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted how broken and divided the world is, and yet at the same time highlighted the interconnectedness of all life. In response to the COVID pandemic, Pope Francis established the COVID-19 Commission and charged the Commission to prepare the future. Prepare the future is radically different from prepare for the future, which implies our future is already set and all we can do is react to it. Prepare the future focuses on our ability to become, as Paul VI invited us to be, artisans of our own destiny. As artisans of our own destiny tonight, we focus on a well-being recovery from COVID. And we're delighted that SKIAF are co-badging our session tonight. And I now welcome Eileen Clarkson, Senior Campaigns Officer, who will say a few words about SKIAF and then welcome and induce our, introduce our companion for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be introducing this evening's companion, Dr. Philippa Whitford, MP, and I'm sure we're all really interested in what she has to say on the topic a well-being recovery from COVID, a topic which she's well-placed to speak about. 
COVID is something that's had the single biggest effect on people globally, arguably in living memory. It's to touch the lives of many people, everyone, and it sadly took the lives of some of our loved ones. It's changed everything from the way many of us work, how we interact with others and how we pray. But if we cast our minds back to the first lockdown, I'm sure we can all recall the excitement and hope vaccines offered as the first step in getting back to normal. However, access to a vaccine programme, as we saw in this country, is not something easily available to everyone. And it's the case that millions of people in low-income countries have not even had their first vaccine. SCIAF, as you know, is the Scottish Catholic International Aid Fund. And we deliver our projects in countries where we work with local partners. But partnership also holds true for our advocacy and campaigning work. And we're, we're in various coalitions and partnerships with other charities and organisations to try and big, bring about change. And one of the organisations that we're a member of is the People's Vaccine Alliance, who are campaigning for vaccine equity um, on COVID. And it's a global alliance, and the members include ourselves, CAFOD and TROCRA. And obviously, this CAFOD has done the most work on vaccine e equity, and I've been doing some work with them on campaigning, uh, which I'm hopeful is going to be public facing in the near future. But when I was trying to get my head around the issues and look and do some research, I was drawn to a quote from Pope Francis on the very subject of vaccines. And it was something he said last year. And he said, everyone, especially the most vulnerable amongst us, requires assistance and has the right to have access to necessary care. And I'm sure you'd agree that those words act as a real incentive. And so with that thought, I'm very happy now to pass over to Phil Whitford. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I have to say I'm delighted to be introduced by SCIAF. I was a SCIAF ambassador uh, from 2006 to 2016, uh, when frankly trying to be an MP and an ambassador at the same time just clearly wasn't working out. Um, and unfortunately, I had to step back. Um, I'm also chair of the all party group on vaccinations for all at Westminster. So what you were talking about around the people's vaccine, I'm also a supporter. Our APPG is uh, a member of that. And I've been campaigning around vaccine equity for low and middle income countries since, frankly, we had a vaccine. And it's ridiculous that more than 18 months on, we have completely failed. In spring 2020, we had really warm words about a global response to a global crisis. Unfortunately, we didn't live up to that at all. It has been wealthy countries who've hoovered up the PPE, have hoovered up the diagnostic tests, and then hoovered up the vaccines. So what we ended up with was, you know, survival of the fittest, devil take the hindmost. Absolutely not something that any of us as Christians should be supporting or tolerating. And that's what we need to change. This, when you look, as you talked about the first lockdown, when our lives literally just had a grenade thrown into them. I mean, I, I remember waking up in the morning and thinking, am I in a science fiction film? You know, we just couldn't imagine how much our lives could change in just a matter of days. And yet there were many things that we learned how to do, including this. We're all experts on Zoom. And I tell you, I couldn't have uh, even found a Zoom app before the pandemic. So we can change when we have to, but we shouldn't wait for disaster to change us. And I think that's why there is a real appetite at this moment in time for us to take radical action and to change. Now, many of you will know that I was a breast cancer surgeon and doctor for almost three and a half decades. So I was often looking after patients, whether from trauma or in general surgery or cancer or breast cancer, one at a time. But gradually, as you become older as a doctor, you realize you're kind of bailing out a boat that's got a hole in it because it's not the NHS that gives you health. The NHS is more about helping you cope with illness, catching you if you fall. 
Now, the problem is it would be more logical to kind of call it a national Ill illness service, but I can't imagine anyone wanting to work in that. But what gives us health and well-being, which is where our focus should go, is quite different. And it's a holistic approach to the well-being of every single person, every single person in Scotland, in the UK, and all our brothers and sisters across the world. And if we start to, to think of that in that holistic way, it also changes our relationship with other people. And it becomes our duty to not just think about ourselves, but to think about the physical, mental, social, economic, and enviral well, um, environmental well-being of every single person around us. Because it is the people around us. We contribute but we also take away, we support, but we also undermine. And most of the policies that actually generate health and well-being are nothing to do with the health service, bar probably vaccination, which does actually protect people throughout their lives. It's generated for children by having a decent start in life, their mother having enough food, them living in a warm home, having enough to eat, having a decent education, social inclusion, not being isolated or lonely. We know now the damage of that, but also having personal agency, having the ability to make decisions for yourself. And we saw how the pandemic undermined that for many people because people were isolated and lonely. People were suffering from the physical illnesses of COVID or physical illnesses that were neglected because of the pressure on the NHS. If they couldn't work, they had financial worries, mental stress, and some sadly have been left with chronic ill health because of COVID. And even the backlog that our health service faces means we can't just easily get treatment for things we took for granted. But on the other side, what I would say is people have reevaluated their priorities. I used to love seeing when I would be out for some exercise, men out on their bikes with all their family who probably at that time of day would have been on a train or in a traffic jam commuting because they were working from home. And so people are re-evaluating. They want a better work-life balance. They prioritize interaction with loved ones over expensive entertainment. They're appreciating if they're lucky enough to live somewhere with access to natural spaces. But all of us here know, because we had COP26 last year, we've been talking about the climate crisis for a long time, that we need a different economic and social model by the end of this decade, or we're simply just going to eat the planet. And this is a moment where people want that change. So as we come back out of COVID, people don't want to go back to business as usual with richer people getting richer and richer, poor people being made poorer and poorer. And the problem is we're in real danger of that now with this cost of living crisis, which is emerging. And we still often see the same approach, that if you have money, you can generate money. If you don't have money, you may just get left behind. So the aim of a well-being economy is for a, an economy that is fairer, that actually values the worth of everybody, but is also more sustainable for the planet. And it's not either or, we go for green and sustainable, or we go for a decent economy. In actual fact, they can both be happening at the same time. And it's quite crucial that they do happen at the same time, if we are going to be in that better place in the next 10 years. What many people don't know is that Scotland was the founder of the Wellbeing Economy Governments Group in 2018 with Iceland and New Zealand and other countries have joined since. It comes up with a framework, it comes up with themes and threads, and it's to try to get public bodies and every level of government when they make decisions to put people at the heart of that. So if you imagine in a local council when they're sitting around talking about a town centre, what dominates in a town centre? Well, I can tell you, it's a car. Where the car can drive, where the car can park, how easily people can get in and out of their cars. Why do we not put people where they walk, where they might cycle, where they might scoot, where they could stand and chat without forcing other people off a pavement into the road, where they could maybe sit down and chat and have some planting and some trees. We've ended up for the last half century 
that it's inanimate objects like cars that dominate the space that we live in, pollute the space we live in, run people over and make our village centers, town centers, not places for us. So all of the things that would generate the well-being, so inclusion, easy to meet people if you're popping down the shops, the good housing, enough food to eat, those are not health service things. They're not things the NHS can fix. They're things that have to actually be fixed fundamentally in the way we organize our economy and how we organize our society. Because poverty is the biggest single driver of ill health. And what we've seen is poverty among children, among elderly and among disabled has actually been on the rise now for the last 10 years. And the problem with that is, it's not something that saves you money. Austerity doesn't save you money. It might look good on a national balance sheet, but what it does is it takes money out of a local economy. It takes money away from local businesses who would employ people, but also you end up picking up the pieces later. So if you think about children, if a woman isn't well enough nourished when she's pregnant, then that child is not getting a decent start in life. If a woman is carrying a female child, all the eggs of that baby are formed during the time in the womb. So actually a woman is carrying her potential grandchildren. So any harm to a pregnant woman is already affecting two generations. And we now know that so much of ill health in later life is affected in these very early months of pregnancy babyhood and childhood. And I remember when I was doing an inquiry into what we might ex expect the impacts of rising child poverty to be, an academic from Liverpool University, a public health scientist, saying that we lose in the UK 1,400 children a year before their 15th birthday as a direct result of poverty. That's from premature birth, low birth weight, fetal alcohol syndrome, house fires, car accidents, addiction, suicide. That's a shocking figure. If there was a large secondary school with the roof collapsing every year, or there was a toxin that was killing every child in one big secondary school every year, surely we would do something about it. So why do we not do something about it? Why have we allowed that our economy and our society is always disadvantaging the most vulnerable, the youngest, the oldest? As Christians, we are people who should want to look after everyone around us. And to me, a well-being economy is something that is looking to be fairer among people, but also fairer to the planet, fairer to the people who are not born yet. So what we often heard since the 80s was this principle of trickle down economics. If you put lots of money in tax cuts at the top, somehow it will percolate down to ordinary people. And we know that doesn't happen in actual fact. So even people who are hard nosed, looking only at the money, that doesn't work. Injecting the money at the bottom where people spend what they earn or what their income is, and they spend it in their local economy, is what actually makes an economy active. It'll all end up in the hands of the banks, the government, or the wealthy, but it will have spiraled up that pyramid, having an impact on the way up. So someone has got money to spend in the butchers or the bakers. The butcher can afford to take his wife out for a meal. She's buying a new jumper in the shop in the town. All of that gives us a vibrant local economy. Whereas what we are often facing is dead high streets, unemployment locally and depressed economies. And it's important that we actually change that shape because the other aspect of it is that we have turned into purely consumers. And that was a change in the eighties. We've lost any sense of satisfaction, any sense of having enough you see people queuing around the block to get a new iPhone, whatever, in the middle of the night, even though their last version works absolutely fine. And so if we're going to improve for people, we need the economy to work to make their lives richer, more fulfilling and healthier. But we in return 
then need to actually look after each other, look after our local economies and look after our planet, both in our local space and the whole planet that we live on. Because we've only got one. If we destroy this planet, you know, there isn't a, black, a backup. As they say, there's no planet B. So what we need to see is that change to something that is fairer, but also more sustainable. To support vulnerable citizens to live in dignity and to be independent, to be active, to be decision makers and to be parts of our community, not to be tidied away where we don't see them and where they can't bother us. But it also calls on us to take actions as individuals. And that is to recover that sense of satisfaction of, I have enough. I don't need to go on earning and earning money at the expense of never seeing my children. I don't need to buy a bigger and faster car, newer iPhones or throw away fashion because all of those things have literally turned us into people who are consuming our planet and are consuming resources that frankly don't belong to us. Many of them belong to people in other parts of the world, but they also belong to those who aren't born yet. So while more of us are conscious of our CO2 footprint, of trying to deal with waste, we recycle, we use energy efficient light bulbs, but we don't always think about stuff, the sheer amount of stuff that we buy, that we hoard, that is bulging out of our cupboards. And all of those things are contributing to our pressure on the planet. We don't bother to look into how they're made. Is there child labor? Is there modern slavery involved? Either in making something or in recycling it. We're often shipping our recycled waste to countries where it is little children who are sifting through parts of computers parts of computers with poisonous heavy metals in them. Do we pay enough attention to that? Do we pay a proper price for the goods that we actually buy that takes account of paying people well and of not destroying the planet? The thing if I'm asked to speak to employers that I remind them, and I would remind anybody on here who does run a business, is your staff are also your customers. So if you don't pay your staff enough to use your services, you're actually undermining your own business. And even if you're someone who, you know, I'm here in, in Ayrshire, Prestwick is in my, my constituency, you know, if you make plane engines, yeah, that's fine. Maybe your staff are not buying a plane engine to take home for the weekend. But if they can't ever afford to go on a holiday, then it's quite simple that you are diminishing your own business. So we need to be thinking about how we make what we make, how we remake it so that it becomes circular and how we actually allow more people to have access to that economy so that they can live comfortably. Because poverty doesn't just drive ill physical health, it drives mental ill health. People worrying, and we're going to see that with this cost of living crisis that is already emerging that people are thinking, how can I keep the lights on? How can I even think of keeping the heating on next year when we get into winter? How can I put enough food on the table? It causes strife between parents. You know, why did you spend that money? So we are going to be seeing more people in that precariousness. And that is why we can't just allow that as we come out of a pandemic that was life-threatening, societally threatening, and threatening to families, individuals, communities. We can't just allow that to follow a natural course without us calling for something different. We saw what communities could really do in the first lockdown. We saw people going and speaking to elderly people through windows, doing their shopping, coming and having a chat, painting rainbows on their windows. We found other ways of being in touch with each other, whether it was Zoom, or standing in the garden talking over the hedge. And that's what we are all called to do. We're all called to be advocates for everyone in our society and also for our planet. And it isn't a choice. So things like a decent, well-insulated house improves fuel efficiency, but it also decreases fuel poverty. 
having more sustainable farming or fishing here in Scotland improves food security, but also can lead to our children having access to better meals in schools, which will help them grow and develop. Now, if we take a well-being approach to international development, when we're dealing as SCIAF does in supporting low and middle income countries and communities there, we actually can realize that we have as much to learn from them. When I became a SCIAF ambassador, we were sent off to Kenya and Tanzania to visit HIV and AIDS projects. And we were told you're not to come back with pictures of children like the old Biafra pictures of children with flies crawling over their eyes. We want positive stories. And I have to admit that sitting on the plane heading out to Nairobi, I thought, how on earth are we going to come back with positive stories for people who are living in one of the largest slums in the world in Nairobi, who are suffering either from HIV or AIDS and living in poverty? And I tell you, I could have come back in 24 hours because the energy, the creativity, the thankfulness of people that you met there was so humbling. You were almost embarrassed to talk about anything. So to me, if we look at how other communities live in different parts of the world, where they still have that inclusion of everyone, that community bonding, there's nobody who's just sitting in a house and nobody ever speaks to them. They have stronger intergenerational family bonds than we have. So if we are supporting people in other parts of the world and a well-being approach where people have enough, enough water, enough food, land that is not destroyed by drought or flood, then you also reduce the risk of conflict and war as we heard in the opening words. So to me, well-being, well-being of ourselves, our family, our community, our country and our planet is something that has to be at the center of how we come out of this pandemic. And I'm already afraid that there is a drift back to business as usual. And, and that if we just do nothing, what we end up with in the next couple of years is going to be quite random. And it is likely that many people will be left behind. And when we get to this en the end of this decade, where there is that last chance to avoid the worst of a climate crisis, we'll be looking back and say, why didn't we take that chance? Because our society and economy was roaring along like a speeding train. And it's hard to modify a train when it's moving. But the one thing that COVID did give us is it brought our society and our economy to a shuddering halt. We all remember that literally from one week to the next, everything we thought we knew and took for granted had stopped. So we actually have a moment of choice at the moment. What is it we want to rebuild? What are we going to expend our time, our energy and our money in rebuilding after COVID? And I would suggest that we all want something different from what we had before COVID. And we have a responsibility as Christians to think about our brothers and sisters across the world, something that is much fairer than what we saw the behavior, whether it's vaccines or diagnostic tests or anything else. The fact that our more vulnerable partner countries in the global south were left with nothing while we hoovered up everything that was available. But also that we think about it's them that will pay the price if we don't tackle the climate crisis. So we know we need to change and this is the moment we need to change it. So we all have that responsibility for everyone who is alive now, not just the people we know or know about or love or care about. We have a responsibility for everyone. But we also have a responsibility for those to come. Any of you who have grandchildren, you know how much you love and adore them. Well, when their time comes, they will also love and adore their grandchildren. So what are we leaving to them? How stressful will our grandchildren feel if when they look at their own grandchildren, they only imagine disaster and nothing positive left on this planet? So I would call on all of us to be advocates for radical change 
and to make sure that we are good ancestors to those who are going to follow after us. Thank you. Philippa, thank you very much. And I'm sure that gives lots to consider, lots to ponder. And I was thinking as you were speaking that it follows on incredibly um, appropriately from our session last week, where we were indeed talking about the circular economy and, and thinking about that model, which you know I, I think you've put into context uh, incredibly well for us tonight. I'm going to give everybody just a, a moment now to consider some questions, some thoughts, some reflections to, to share within the, the chat uh, for us to start our conversation together tonight. But perhaps, Philip, I, I could um, draw you in a bit more on the experience that you had as a SCIAF ambassador and that you, know, you, you spoke a bit about how easily you would have come back 24 hours later with positive examples. And I think that's something that really touches so many of us who've heard that tonight from you. And I just wonder if you might say a bit more about how we can learn from that example where rather than immediately jumping to dare I say the more depressing kind of stories that we consider, how can we learn from our sisters and brothers across our worldwide family? Well, I think um, when I was there, I, I met a young man who had was an AIDS orphan. Um, had grown up as sadly many children do in, in sub-Saharan Africa who've been left orphaned by AIDS, um, was literally growing up on a landfill site for want of a better description. He was spotted by a tourist many years before who'd actually realized he was a very bright boy and funded his education all the way through uh, the Catholic university. So secondary school, uh, Catholic university. <clears throat> so he was very highly educated. So he could move, have moved on into a totally different quality of life. But actually what he'd chosen to do was to go back and help to rescue other children that were living the life that he lived. And I mean, I, 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 remember, I, mean, I remember the stench of the place. I remember they were trying to pick food out from the discarded rubbish. You know, it was really hard to keep a straight face and, and not show disgust at what they were gathering and what they were going to eat. There were boys that were maybe 10, 11, who were looking after kids who were five or six. I mean, it was absolutely heartbreaking. And they all had these masks on. And I thought it was against the smell, but it was actually glue. They were addicted to, to sniffing glue as the only way to escape the stench, the squalor of literally living 24 seven on a landfill site. And what he did was he began, if you like, this, this tiny, tiny wee steps of how to help them find their own humanity. Um, we then, and, and one of your um, companions that I know from, uh, from last year, um, Marion, who was also an ambassador, uh, supports an orphanage out in, in Lusaka, who I visited later. But as, as he said, these boys couldn't even have gone to an orphanage. They couldn't have coped with any kind of, you know, regimentation or normal behavior. And, and he put all that time in with them to the point where they could be taken into an orphanage. And to watch someone who'd had the chance to completely escape that squalor, to actually go back and spend all of his working life in that, trying to rescue these young teenagers. And so you had these boys who were starting school for the first time at 16, you know, who were getting clean clothes or new clothes or new-ish clothes for the first time in their lives that, that he was bringing them to. And when we were then working with other groups and, and, you know, having prayer sessions, the sheer energy and joy and thankfulness. And, you know, I thought of some of our you know, some of our liturgies can get a bit dirge-like and we can be sitting there on a hard bench on a Sunday kind of thinking, you know, when's dinner time and, you know, for goodness sake, the sermon's been 20 minutes long already. You know, their masses are like three hours long and they're singing and they're dancing and they're joyful. And, and I just, I mean, I just felt kind of humble and shamed. So they were thankful for everything in their life that was good instead of focusing on everything in their life that was bad and they were thankful to God for those things. And, you know, in our society, 
that is something that we've lost. I don't even mean whether you're a religious person of faith or not, but just to be thankful, you know, to be thankful for a beautiful day, to be thankful if you are well, not to be worrying what your legs look like, but if they work, you know, if you can walk from A to B, that is a big thing to be thankful for. So I think that the kind of the joyfulness, the passion of their faith and their thankfulness was something that really pulled me up short. And, and the story of the young man that I'd met, I thought I, I could go and talk about him. That's more than enough. I don't I don't need to see anything else. And I think that witness is so powerful as well, that, that kind of lived reality and, and refreshing our memory of that. But of course, in amongst all of this, and the two questions that I'm going to turn to now reflect the fact that this can all feel incredibly overwhelming, especially when, you know, if we are sitting somewhere comfortable, so many, it, it can feel so overwhelming to look at the issues uh, that are affecting the world. I think, you know, you only need to turn on a TV screen for five minutes to feel completely depressed at the moment, don't you? And with that in mind, I suppose we're often told we need to start somewhere. If you had to pick one issue, Philippa, to start with, what would it be? I think, like everything, we should start as individuals, you know, rather than just uh, pontificating about someone else should do something. I mean, frankly, there's a lot that we could all do, and we know that, whether it's being kinder to our neighbours, particularly the ones we don't like, you know, being kind to people you like is easy, but actually that you know, grumpy old man that lives down the street who shouts at you when you walk past with your dog, but he's on his own. That's the person that you should be putting the effort into. Looking at your own uh, footprint on the planet and thinking about whether it's your energy, whether it's your stuff. Are you somebody who always has to have the latest gadgets or the latest fashions? You know, exactly how are you living? on this planet. So sometimes we use the sheer enormity of a problem as an excuse to not take action. But I often think if you if you imagine, you know, if you throw a stone into a pond and you get all these ripples, but it's only that one stone in that one pond, then all the ripples go out and it fades away. But if you have people standing all around the pond who throw a stone in, the ripples all start intersecting. And, and suddenly you start to see a joined up pattern. So it's, it's kind of looking at your individual behavior and then looking in your community. What can I do? Can I pick up rubbish in the park? Can I support a youth group? You know, am I helping in the food bank? Whatever it is. And many of us know things, and I'm sure many of you are involved, but are we going far enough in challenging ourselves in working in our communities, but also challenging our communities. We, we often feel like we're a wee bit too polite to kind of challenge other people to do something. But if you're actually going to be an advocate, that does mean that you have to, you know, talk the hard talk to other people, whether it's folk in your family or friends or, or in your community. And I, I do really worry that you know, we did say we don't want to go back to business as usual. We want to build forward in the direction we know we have to get to in what is now only eight years. And the problem is that if we don't stand up, if we don't speak out, then none of that is going to change. And at the end of this, we will have that the millionaires are billionaires and the children who are in poverty simply have no decent life to look forward to. And when you think about that way forward, as you describe it, Philippa, do you see signs of hope? I think there always is. I mean, I think if you look in your own community, there will have been people, and I think COVID sh it showed that. You had people just being so inventive and coming up with ways of supporting each other. I think particularly in the first lockdown. I mean, I used to say, oh, we shouldn't use the phrase social distancing what we mean is physical distancing, but actually socially, we need to be closer together. And, and I think we saw that in most communities. Now, that may have been harder if you were living in a big city or if you didn't have people uh, th that you knew or people who were being active around you. But in many communities, we absolutely saw that. And I think the public now is ready for that kind of radical change. You know, if we were saying to people, 
three or four years ago. And, and of course, people were. We need to tackle climate change. We need to lead, change how we live, change what kind of car we drive. Don't drive a car, walk or cycle. You know, why are we driving literally half a mile to the shops if there's nothing wrong with us? You know, all of these kind of conversations were happening. But there was a kind of, oh, no, that's that's too much hair shirt. That would be too miserable. I couldn't be bothered with that. And I just think that change in how people lived with many people working from home, many people who work realizing what they got back in having more time with their family. You know, you think of the people across the UK who commute two hours and then sit in a big open plan office on a computer and then commute another two hours home, either in a car, a train, a tube or whatever. And they got literally four hours a day of their lives back so that suddenly they saw their kids before they went to bed or they could get out in the fresh air with their family. So I just I think there are many people who, in a very personal way, don't want to go back to the way they lived before. And I also think there is just that greater recognition that we can cope with sudden change. We could be radical because two years ago we had to be radical with no choice. Well, actually, unless we are going to allow poorer people to literally just die, die of starvation, die of cold. And unless we're going to let the planet self-destruct or have wars, not about oil as they were in the past, but about water, about land that can sustain crops. That is as important as the choices we faced in March, 2020, which was no choice at all. We don't have a choice. We have to change. And I think the public is much more open to having those kind of radical conversations now than they would ever have been. And I just worry that we might just miss that opportunity. And it would seem, Philippa, that to properly address that, what's then needed is a massive shift in narrative. So I'm wondering, I'm going to turn, turn maybe to, to the question here from Rosa. How difficult does that become when, for example, the, the media so powerfully supports the economic structures, the policies that grow the rich and just accept that the poor are poor? I, I mean, I think there's a lot of issues in our media at the moment. It's not terribly discussive. It doesn't tend to unpack challenging issues, I would suggest. Um, I think there's a lot going on in our politics, in our society, where we should really be having hard public debates People down the pub should know what are the issues and in among the football or something else, they should be talking about some of these things and thinking about some of these things. So I think, I mean, we saw it even around climate change, that nonsense of balance, allowing genuine climate experts to be put against a climate denier. So, you know, where 90% plus of modern research and science was had one voice which was then put against someone who you know just made stuff up or found something on the internet so we we've actually had over climate very um twisted discussions about what we need to do and all of that has held us back from taking action we've also seen it and i have to say i found it very difficult when i went to Westminster, the politics of othering, you know, um, it's disabled people, poor people are lazy. I mean, even the stuff of the last couple of weeks, you just need to work harder or get a better job. You just need to learn to cook. You know, it's your fault you're poor. It's not the fact that I was lucky enough to have, you know, a millionaire father. It's, you know, your fault for choosing bad parents. So, you know, our narrative around why there are people who are more vulnerable or how you at least make sure that people have a level playing field. You'll, you'll know the kind of pictures of, you know, level playing field is not giving two people who are on a slope the same size of ladder. It's giving the child who's much further down the slope the much taller ladder to catch up. And, you know, we're not changing those things. So unless we do that, unless we really try to invest, and that's what, I mean, you'll, you'll be aware of Sir Harry Burns, the, the kind of um, early years collaborative, which was to try to really be looking 
at our children, at our babies. You know, it's where the idea of the baby box comes from, that every child in Scotland is welcomed and has that kind of same start chance, but that you're actually looking at what is it that is damaging our children before they even get to school. We expect schools to make up the difference, but there are children who are really already massively disadvantaged before they even get to that point. So, you know, we've all got the aches and pains and crumbly bits that we've all got. So we need looked after. And for many of us, that will be the NHS. In time, it will be social care. But we should still all be thinking as good ancestors about how do we make sure that the generations that are following us don't just replay the same tape, that they have a better start, but they also have a chance to live in a decent environment that is not just burning up. And, and, and obviously, you know, we're talking about COVID, obviously as a health spokesperson that dominated my life for the last couple of years, including when I was back in the NHS. But the climate crisis is a much bigger challenge. So the fact that we didn't manage to work together to tackle COVID is that's the biggest lesson that we have to learn as politicians in the international community as nations is we can't afford to make that mistake again. We need to learn how to be radical and we need to learn how to work together to make the changes. As you mentioned, Harry Burns there, Philip, or the other person that comes to my mind is John Carnahan and his notion of the first four, the, the, the most important four years of a child's life are up to age three, that idea of thinking about the Yeah, there's a, I'm a um, supporter of what's called the Thousand and One Day Manifesto, which is from uh, conception to two years, which is, is that, and it's there for that whole idea of the impact of your mother's health when you were actually in the womb and how much of your own later in ill health that that influences. So, I mean, we are trying to do that, but you, you're often, you know, trying to turn a tanker. And, and the problem is so much of the economic, our obsession with growth, our obsession with GDP. I mean, GDP includes illegal drugs and prostitution. People often don't realize that, that all of that is included in GDP. What is good about that? We don't need to just grow and grow and grow and grow. We need to have sustainable growth. We need that circular economy that you were obviously talking about last year. And some of that would be not just us as individuals having a sense of enough. I'm really lucky. Um, you know, I, I, I have a house that has a garden. I'm an incredibly lucky person. And I remember just coming back to Skiaf that there was a poster that I think they should reprint. And it was the circles of people and the percentages. And it was like, you know, if you have a roof over your head, if, if you don't live in a house that has a dirt floor, if you actually have water, you know, if you have actually got water that comes to your house, you know, you're in this tiny percentage of people in the planet. And, and I, I, it was on the back of a door, I think it was in a toilet somewhere in, in Skiaf headquarters years ago. But actually that for us who may think, oh, well, we're not doing all that well to realize on the scale of the world, how lucky many of us are. And I think what COVID will have done for many, and, and it's a thing that's always been clear to me, uh, looking after breast cancer patients, walking that last journey with people, is that at the end of life, there are only a couple of things that are important. You will wish you had your health if you've lost your health. You will wish that you'd treasured it more. You might even wish that you had used it more, that you'd done wilder things, that you'd climbed more mountains or skied or whatever it was, but you will wish that you had treasured your health. And the other thing is just the people you love, not your car, not your job, not your house, not anything else. And I've watched walking that journey with women, I've watched all that rubbish fall away and if all of us, and I, I mean me, I've watched that journey with women, and yet I still get caught up in the same kind of habits that all of us do. But if all of us focused more on taking care of not just our health, but our well-being, but taking care of each other and widening that definition of those who we love, then we could all be making a difference. And we reflected a lot there on media earlier on, but 
as you mentioned yourself, we spoke a bit about political discourse and the challenges that, that you see in your own role at the moment. I'm wondering um, how the quality of political discourse at the moment might make it a challenge to move forward. Is there that openness to expert opinion when it's debated in Westminster, for example? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't want this to go too political, so um, I'll, I'll try to be careful in what I'm saying. I think political discourse is difficult. I think political discourse with the public uh, often gets reduced to 240 characters on Twitter and you cannot debate anything sensitive or uh, subtle uh, very easily on Twitter. Although I do have to stick up for it in the pandemic, scientists were using it really well to share research. Instead of you having to pay 400 pounds a year to subscribe to a science journal and wait months and months for research to be posted, they were actually just sharing. This is what we're seeing. This is what we're learning. So it was really good for that. But it is, as a woman politician, it's a very aggressive space. It's not a very pleasant space to be in if, if you're a target. And I mean, you'll have watched Westminster. I mean, I'm just back from uh, Brussels and um, from Germany visiting my husband's family for the first time since the pandemic. And their politics is kind of boring. You know, they look at ours and kind of think it's kind of fun to watch because everybody's shouting at each other. But then again, you know, do you want to live in a completely wild country or would you quite like to live in Germany or Switzerland where the trains run on time and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the kind of that aggression and shouting and interaction that may look entertaining from people, for people watching Westminster from outside often and particularly now um, gets in the way of getting things done. Um, I've been in three parliaments, the David Cameron one, the Theresa May hung parliament, and then the Boris Johnson one, and they've been three utterly different parliaments. And I would say that particularly now, it is harder to get work done cross party than it was. You know, when I made my maiden speech, I got little letters from parties all over the house saying, fantastic, well done, welcome to, to parliament. If I did a health speech, I would always consider it a success if I had Conservative and Labour MPs coming up going, oh, that's great. I really understood that. You know, now I know what you mean, um, rather than it just be a slanging match. But so often it, it turns into that. And, and I do think that there is a, a bit of an issue at the moment with some of the recent laws that have been passed that take away the power of the public as voters or protesters or parliamentarians to actually hold governments to account. There's an awful lot of things now that any minister can just simply do without coming to parliament. And I think that's kind of a bit worrying, but I also think our media, as you talked about, they're part of that. You need an educated public if you're going to challenge politicians. You need an educated public if you're gonna challenge all the kind of standard ways of thinking. So the media, you know, there are one or two exceptions who are marvelous, but in general, the media is all just little short sound bites and, and you'll get a theme that will run in little snippets rather than someone who's unpacking. Why is the situation like this in that country? How did that conflict come about? What is the history of Iraq or Afghanistan or Yemen? How did we get here? You know, even the issues in Northern Ireland, which which is where I'm from, which are obviously really looming at the moment, is is kind of how did we get here and what are the decisions we need to make next? So I think the media are definitely not paying playing the role that they should be playing. You've also spoken, Philippa, about the, the potential dangers of the current direction of travel. And one of our comments in the chat speaks in particular about um, returning to an old economic model, removing basic human rights and so on. So how do we engage in creating and implementing, implementing a new way of living together that does reflect the gospel values? Well, I think that, you know, I think it is that kind of, you know, in, in little concentric circles of the people around you, the people in your community. You know, I, I get asked to do lots of talks about politics, you know, why should you go into politics? What is politics? Um, both to young people, but also particularly to women and girls, 
um, because they're still not very well represented, but also people with disability who are not well represented. And, and I always talk about politics with a small p. Politics is not what's happening in Westminster or Holyrood. You know, politics touches every aspect of your life and you can touch politics. So if you are picking up litter, if you're organizing, you know, a coffee morning or a dementia friendly uh, group in, in your own community, then you're doing politics with a small p. So, you know, to me, I think that's what we all, it's where people start. The best politicians that I've met in any party are all people who were doing something, who believed in something, and were just getting on with that. And then had other people say, you know, you should, you should stand, you should become a politician. But in actual fact, that's who you want to be doing what we think of as pol politics with a capital P. But all of us should be doing politics with a small P. What's wrong in your community? Why are you waiting for someone else to change it? How could you make it better? And equally, we all have to speak out. We can't allow, I mean, I think one of the, the tragic things of the UK is seeing the cut to the, the overseas aid budget. You know, we pride ourselves, we hear lots of boasting about being the fifth richest economy in the world. And yet we have cut the money we give to polio elimination by 95%. How do we justify that? that there will be children living with polio paralysis in the future, when actually because of the impact of the pandemic, we should be giving more funding to catch up the backlogs of routine childhood immunization in low and middle income countries. So, you know, we're, we're a bit kind of, whether it's in our way of living or within our politics, we're kind of a little bit turned in and a bit inward looking and a bit selfish at the moment. And the people who can change that are people who are willing to make a noise, speak out, be active in their community. And just, you know, you can't change the whole world all by yourself. But if everybody joins hands and does their wee bit, it's amazing how much difference that you can make. It does sound, though, Philippa, as if there's a need for perhaps more radical conversations. And there's a question in the chat asking how we can facilitate them. How can we move out with our own bubble? And you spoke a bit about that in your own sense earlier about, you know, in, in Parliament, you know, a good speech was one where the opposition were, were complimenting it. So how do we move out with our own bubbles, especially when I think public discourse, never mind political discourse, is becoming increasingly fragmented and oppositional? Well, I think that last word you used, oppositional, is um is the key you know you don't change somebody's mind by hitting them over the head you know if if you remember the 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 kind of uh, fable of you know the 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 wind and the rain and the sun and whatnot trying to get the man to take his coat off the wind didn't blow his coat coat off it was the sun shining that made him take his coat off maybe i'm just being too old that i remember that story but you know it's persuasion and therefore it's being polite, it's being welcoming, and it's trying to actually explain something in a way that invites a response. Whereas what we've ended up, particularly with things like social media, with uh, broadcast and newspaper media that is very soundbitey and about pushing stuff at you rather than getting discourse going. Um, again, don't want to get into politics too much, but one of the things that I loved about the independence referendum, which is how I landed here, I have to blame it for that, was regardless of what side you were on, people were talking. There was an incredible energy, particularly among young people, talking about politics in, in a way that had never existed in my younger life. So, you know, we need those kind of conversations. We need town halls and village halls. We need people to be organizing what I used to organize during that time called coffee and conversation. Not necessarily even a speaker, though you might have a speaker, you might have a facilitator. And obviously these kind of events that you're doing, when these move off Zoom and start to move into to physical spaces, that opportunity, not just to go to Pentecost, but actually to go beyond that, so that we start to have those conversations and people meet each other and go, well, you know, I can do this and you can do that. So if we put those two skills together, how could we make an influence? You know, starting petitions, making a noise, speaking out, because 
we are at this absolute pivotal moment when, as I say, we have no choice. We need to change to not just leave vulnerable people behind and to not just let the planet go up in flames. And if we miss it, we'll regret it. I noticed in the, the chat, just as you were sharing there, Philippa, um, we've got a comment very much agreeing with your comment for the need to stand up and be active in taking action in our local community. Now, we've spoken a lot about the kind of strategic and national policy. I wonder if I can take it for a moment into something very local. And as a local MP, I'm sure you'll have seen examples of that witness in local community from many individuals and groups, and some of it must be incredibly inspiring. Would you share some examples of things that you think have made the biggest difference on a local level? Well, I, um, I always think of my job as a stool with three legs. Obviously, what um, most people would be aware of is if I'm up on my hind legs down in Westminster, you know, doing a speech or asking a question or, or, or making a point. Um, you then have the bit which is helping individuals. And, you know, my, my team find it quite ironic that they're called surgeries. Um, they are very like clinics, come in, sit down, what is your problem? Can I diagnose what the underlying issue is and can I fix it? But the third bit, and this is probably one of the bits that I enjoy most, although obviously COVID has dampened it, is the involvement with community groups and projects. And I've had the um, great honour of actually being able to get a lot of things off the ground that didn't exist. Um, kind of cycle friendly, troon, dementia friendly groups, because I meet all sorts of people. I meet, you know, local big businesses, I meet individuals, I meet tiny community projects. And, and we're in an incredible position as MPs that you can actually bring them all together. So I used to run community uh, engagement fairs where people who had an idea or were trying to do something could come and have a wee stall. And I then invited all the big businesses who were desperate to actually do social engagement, social responsibility, but had no idea where to start. And you start putting people together or simply in surgeries or at local galas. I meet four people who want to do something about our beach or develop, you know, cycling projects or to, you know, have activities for the older people in our community, particularly we've now got uh, a couple of dementia friendly groups, which I think can make a big difference. Um, they haven't met each other, but I've met all of them. So, so that ability for people who are in that position of kind of being on their own. And as I say, that sense of, well, what could I do? The moment you introduce them to each other, suddenly things start to happen. And the thing is through social media, including local community Facebooks, other things is people just need to be brave and go, I would love to do this. Is there anyone out there who fancies working with me to do this? And then you'll start to connect up because it's all about connection. It's hard to achieve everything by yourself, but actually you don't need big numbers of people to start to make things happen within your community. And once things do start to happen, then other things suddenly join on to that. There's other people who have ideas and they then approach this group. This is something different, but you're already working on this. Can you tell me how to get started? So I think a lot of it is don't be shy. Don't be, you know, kind of sitting back waiting for someone else. Use the technology, the opportunities, the local paper, whatever it is, write a letter in um, or use social media, which, you know, lots of people use. It's not just young people that use Facebook um, to actually put yourself out there because that's what it often needs is that first person who's willing to say you know I you know my mother has dementia we can't even go into a cafe she never gets to go to the cinema I would like to make things better is there anyone else who would like to work with me and suddenly you've got a group of volunteers who all have a personal interest in turning that round so two of my Towns, Troon and Prestwick have got dementia friendly groups. Uh, the first one was Prestwick and that inspired me to get the one in Troon going. Prestwick has a dementia friendly cinema uh, where people sit with home baking and tea and coffee and can go up and wander off if they, if they want to. They do uh, walks. They have the cycling without age, you know, the, the electric bikes that are like 
rickshaws to take people along the promenade. In Truden, we have dementia friendly golf, we have an allotment and people can go between the two towns. So, you know, just finding people who thought, you know, dementia is a growing issue. It's maybe in my family or I've met it in my professional life. How do we make our community more inclusive? And when you start making a community more inclusive, so I managed with others to get supermarkets to set up what we call relaxed lanes, where someone who needs a wee bit more time for whatever reason can take their time and not feel huckled by those of us who are all being impatient and tapping our watches behind them. You know, that isn't just people with dementia, that's lots of people. So the moment you start looking at making your community inclusive and kinder and more welcoming, you actually start to help a whole lot of people in that. And suddenly you find other people come forward with ideas. So I think with all of it, it doesn't matter what the, um, doesn't matter what the idea is in your local community, the thing that's been rattling around in your head, just get on with it. You spoke earlier, Philippa, about the, the referendum as a time of rich debate and perhaps a political renaissance. Um, I wonder, looking at the chat here, if, if that heightened level of political discussion and the richness of the debate was something that was frightening to an establishment which was comfortable in itself. Um, and that's the question that's being asked is, you know, effectively, where someone may have wanted to continue in ways of old, does this come as too much of a challenge? Well, I, I think that is um, that certainly a bit of what's going on at, at the moment, as a, uh, we were talking before we started this, some of the changes in legislation uh, around the Electoral Commission and protests, your right to protest, um, you know, uh, photo ID for voting. You know, someone with a disability who is not well off will not have a photo driving license and may never have a passport because they can't afford to go overseas on holiday either. So, you know, we've seen that kind of thing in other countries, suppress turnout. So, you know, there, there's a lot of legislation that has gone through that just makes it a bit harder for us to change our politics at Westminster at the moment. And that is concerning. Um, but the, equally, that shouldn't stop any of us speaking out. We all have that duty. And there are certainly many groups who are concerned about changes to the Human Rights Act, concerned about the changes to, um, you know, electoral rights or the franchise, um, you know, et cetera, that, that, that are there. So, you know, there are people, other people to be found. And, and it, you know, we can work with people who are from different threads and backgrounds. You know, people don't need to have the same faith as us. They don't need to, to, to have any faith at all. If they are people who want to look out for those who are weakest in our society, you, you find the common points you have with someone else rather than focusing on, on the differences. And I think that is something that is quite important is that I, there is that negative pushback which clearly wants to go back to business as usual where the wealthy get a kind of free ticket to life and, and everyone else is left behind. And, and I think all of us need to make as much noise as we possibly can in whatever way we can to fight that both in our, in our close circles, in our communities, but also in our politics. We don't have the right to sit back and not bother. I mean, the thing that makes me saddest when I'm fighting an election is when, not when I knock on a door and someone says, oh, I vote for that other party. It's when someone says, oh, I never bother voting. That absolutely breaks my heart. Because as I said, politics is not all politics with a capital P, but politics touches every single aspect of your life. So if you're gonna abrogate responsibility by never engaging either in discussion or voting at any level, then you've absolutely no influence on what might come down the track towards you. So I, I think at whatever level people get involved in politics, and I don't mean standing for election, but being active in trying to build the communities and the world that we all know that we want to have. There's nobody else sitting around who's gonna do that. It's basically us. We also spoke in amongst that conversation about the referendum as well, about the voice of young people. 
um, and you know, I'm sitting here now as a, a teacher and thinking very much about young people, but I'm also mindful we're talking about a well-being economy tonight and thinking of the fact that well-being is something that's so familiar to our young people, it's a core part of their curriculum, it's a term that they're used to. Do you think that that's something that over time will, will shift discourse completely, will shift um, expectations dramatically in terms of what is expected around well-being and in terms of the priorities politically, nationally demanded by the electorate of tomorrow, perhaps, who are our young people for whom this is so important today? I mean, I, I've seen that in my career in medicine. I mean, when I started in surgery and when I started in surgery, there were no women surgeons at all uh, in Scotland. So, and less than 1% in, in the whole of the UK. Um, and there was an expectation that if you did one of those acute specialties, if you did surgery, even if you did medicine, yeah, it was going to involve, you know, over a hundred hours a week. And that's just how it is. And you may not get to have kids. And if you have kids, you're never going to see them anyway. And, and so my generation went in and that's what it was like. And we worked the long hours. And, you know, sometimes people came to a really bad end. We had high suicide rates, high divorce rates, burnout rates, mental breakdown rates. Already the medical generation behind me has no truck with that at all. So they're less obsessed by success, getting a big car, whatever. They more want to get that work-life balance so because I was working um you know 50 60 hours a week in Crosshouse my husband was a part-time GP and when he applied he was the last applicant they interviewed because they interviewed all the women first because it seemed so weird for a man to want to work part-time uh, in the end they took they didn't like any of the women I don't know why uh, so they gave him a shot and interviewed him and he got the job. When he retired a couple of years ago, there wasn't a single one of his colleagues who works what would have been defined as old full time, not one of them. So men or women, all of them were working three quarter time, half time, whatever. Now that has posed a real challenge to the Scottish government in that they expected to, you know, so many medical students will give us so many doctors. But obviously it's not. You actually need to increase your student body by a third to make up for that. But that change came about in less than 10 years between 2010 and 2020. And that's because you're seeing people who are in professions where people, yeah, they had money, they were well paid, but they just burned their way through their lives. Their kids didn't know them. They were never there at a point at important dates they're not willing to live like that. So I think we're already seeing that change. So not just in the pupils that you're teaching, but in, in probably among some of your colleagues and certainly also in, in, in other professions. The problem is, is that we need that to be part of that public discourse. We can't wait for someone who's 11 now to be prime minister before we get change. We actually, we have the responsibility to them to make sure that that world, that kind of more balanced, kinder, dignified world that will survive is there for them to grow up into. So I think it's changing. I think it's already changing, you know, the kind of idea of, you know, 24 seven, always in the office, always on, look at me, some macho businessman from the city of London. I think there's just less admiration for that kind of thing. And I think the COVID, people working less because of furlough, people working from home, people, you know, their whole kind of way they worked and worked uh, from home or work less will accelerate that. But it's how we now change that into the normality because we are back to talk about growth, about GDP, etc. And, you know, what we're seeing is, you know, we've got 9% inflation, we've got people at the lower end, the food inflation for them is over 50%. So if you buy, you know, the saver versions of what's ever in Morrison's or something else, the prices of some of those things have doubled. Energy prices have doubled. And yet people lost the funding uh, that was taken away from universal credit. So the people at the very bottom of the economic pyramid are, nothing's happening for them at the moment to support them. So we are kind of going back to that. We're already hearing about tax cuts for 
businesses and, and different things. So we are kind of going back to the, if we put money, money at the top, it'll trickle down, everyone will benefit. And really that's been disproven so many times. Um, so I, I think that we can't just wait for them. We, the adults, the good ancestors, have the responsibility to, before we shuffle off our mortal coil, to make sure that what we're leaving behind for them is not a planet on fire, but actually a planet that they can enjoy. And I think we've maybe got time for, for one more question, um, Philippa. Sure. I'm wondering then, almost to tie up everything that we've been talking about tonight, amid the challenges that have been described in the chat as overwhelming, and the hope that you've spoken about and that you've seen um, in your own work and in your own witness, where should the voice of the church be? What should the church be saying and what should the church be doing amid the picture that we see at the moment? And well, I think the church that. should be outspoken and I think the church should be radical. And I think we're incredibly lucky in the Pope that we have at the moment. Um, I, I, my husband and I uh, run the youth ministry in, in our church and um, we, I mean, obviously everything is pre-COVID, nothing is completely back to normal, but we used to do uh, youth-led Stations of the Cross, and they were all there uh, ready to do that when the election of Pope Francis happened. And so our priest asked, you know, it, it's nearly over, it's nearly over, can we delay? So we literally had these kids, 11 and others, round the iPad, listening to, you know, kind of the, the election of Pope Francis, and then his first words and and that little group were almost left with he's our pope you know we were there we were there at that moment and the things he has stood up and spoken out about have have made me so proud but sometimes when we get down and i don't mean our just catholic church but christian church get down to our local churches we can all drift back into that being judgmental, being a bit snobby, being a bit middle class, or, you know, yes, we all think this for that hour that we're in church. And then we go out and, you know, we are ruthless business people or we're sloppy in what we do or we don't pay attention to our neighbour. I mean, we've all heard it often enough. You know, faith is not one hour a week. It's something that should run through us like, um, you know, streaks through marble. So, Pope Francis is very clear about what we should be doing to our precious home, this planet, how we should be looking out for each other, how we should be um, trying to remove the friction that is caused by greed and want and need and exploitation. Otherwise, you know, as I say, the future wars won't be about oil. They will be about land and water. So I, I think he is an absolute beacon but it's how we get that into our parishes. You know, we've all had a bit of a weird time, you know, watching mass on Zoom or, you know, only getting to go to church so many times because so many people can fit in at one time. But how do we get our parishes back up and active? How do we get our parishes to be a family that looks after everyone in that family, but also then feels that it's looking after people in the community? I, I, I'm coming from Northern Ireland, where obviously the sectarianism is, is a real problem. Living here in Troon, where we have Troon churches together, that they do so many things together in Holy Week, all the ministers and priests preach in each other's churches. You know, big issues are often tackled together. You know, we need to be working with other people of faith, but also with people of no faith, who want to look after the human dignity of people around them. So I, that's where I think we're not, you know, we need to get back to being together, but we also need to get back to being active. So it's not just enough to watch, you know, mass on Zoom, obviously the receiving communion, you know, giving a symbol of peace to someone, whether it's a bow or, you know, whatever it is to people, it, that's important. That's part of community and family. But then what are we doing with it? How do we take the energy of parish family life and actually make that something that supports everyone in that parish, but also then radiates out into our community? And I think that bit needs, needs some work, not just getting back physically, but actually taking what Pope Francis says seriously and acting on it.
Well, Philippa, thank you very much. I have enjoyed our conversation immensely and looking at the chat and I hope you get a chance to see it yourself. There are plenty of words of thanks there for you too. So thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to everyone for your questions. I'm going to hand back over now to Eileen. Philippa, thank you so much for, for tonight. I mean, it's been so inspirational to us all. And I'd just like to say prayer for you. Loving God, we thank you for the insight, vision and service of Philippa. We thank you for what she has shared with us tonight. We ask that you anoint her anew, such that her life and her service may continue to be empowered by your spirit. Amen. Can I thank you and all the others on this for such a kind and beautiful prayer. That was very touching and I really appreciate it. Thanks, Philippa. And thank you, Eileen. And we now offer a prayer for Skiaf. God of creation, we thank you for Skiaf. We pray that your spirit will empower them to make manifest Christ's love in their work with those in the world's poorest places to end poverty to protect our common home and help people recover from disaster. Amen. Amen. And we close the formal part of our evening by praying for all of us gathered here tonight that we may go forth empowered by the Holy Spirit, praying a prayer to the Holy Spirit written by our friend and companion Dear Mud Umarku. Come, Holy Spirit, breathe down upon our troubled world. Shake the tired foundations of our crumbling institutions. Break the rules that keep you out of all our sacred spaces. And from the dust and rubble, gather up the seedlings of a new creation. Come Holy Spirit, inflame once more the dying embers of our weariness. Shake us of our complacency. Whisper our names once more and scatter your gift of grace with wild abandon. Break open the prisons of our inner being and let your raging justice be our sign of liberty. Come, Holy Spirit, lead us to places we would rather not go. Expand the horizons of our limited imaginations. Awaken in our souls dangerous dreams for a new tomorrow and rekindle in our hearts the fire of prophetic enthusiasm. Come, Holy Spirit, whose justice outweighs international conspiracy, whose light outshines spiritual bigotry, whose peace can overcome the destructive potential of warfare, whose promise invigorates our every effort to create a new heaven and a new earth, now and forever. Empowered by the Spirit, we continue the mission entrusted to us. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Mm -hmm. So, next Thursday, we continue our Towards Pentecost series with Sarah Augustine who will share some insights on owning our Christian history with a particular focus on the doctrine of discovery. This session in our contribution with a global Laudato Si Week. Thank you for all being with us tonight and thanks to Eileen and Skiaf. To those who are leaving the meeting at this point, good night, God bless and we invite you to log off. For those who wish to stay on and enjoy a breakout room, please stay connected. And in a few minutes, we will generate the breakout rooms. Thank you.